Well, I love that clip, and uh, for the record, I, um, I, when we had a, a, a fourth kid, I told my wife, the only way we'll do it is if you let me, if it's a boy, name it Ricky Bobby. So uh, thank God we didn't have, thank God we didn't have a, a son, right? God gave us Aurora instead. But I love that clip because he thought that he was hurt, didn't he? He thought that he was hurt, but it turned out it was all in his head. And I kind of relate to that. I mean, for the record, I'm kind of a hypochondriac, like big time, okay? I mean, my wife this week took a knife, and she was pitting an avocado, right? And she missed the pit, and she went right into her thumb, probably down to the bone. I mean, it was, a, it was actually a pretty deep wound. She's bleeding, and I am, like, about ready to, uh, you know, get, call a helicopter in. I mean, it's bad. And she just, she goes out, she gets Loctite, you know, for bolts, and she just glues that thing shut, just glues it shut, you know, breaks open a couple times. I'm like, we need to go to the ER. She's like, no, it's fine. Me, the other day in the church lobby, um, I spilled a small amount of coffee on my hand. And I'm like, oh, 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 and I'm like trying to hold it together. Pat Seegers is there like, is he crazy or is he okay? You know, and I'm thinking in my head, first degree burns. I got to go to the hospital. I don't think I can preach. Like, I don't know what to do. Zachary, saddle up. It's done. You know, they're going to amputate my hand. Not kidding. But uh, we've been in this series called This Is My Year. It's all about inviting God into 2018. And I want 2018 to be your very best year yet. I want this to be the best year of your life. And um, we've been setting goals as individuals and as a church. Goals are great, but now comes the hard part, doesn't it? Like actually keeping the goal is hard. I mean, many of us have probably already quit our New Year's resolutions. It's easy to make a goal in the emotional excitement of a service, you know. It's easy to make a goal while everybody around you is excited about it. But when you get home, now you're on your own in your nitty-gritty house. And you got to figure out, well, how do I actually do this, right? And um, I want to talk about sustaining a goal. I want to talk about keeping a goal. And when I was in college, I played lots of intramural sports. And um, I didn't play them because I liked them. I played them because my brother did it, and I wanted to be like him. So uh, I did these intramural sports. And I'm so competitive. Like, if I lose, it's just the end of the world. My life is over. This is why I don't try to be needlessly playing sports that I could possibly lose at. But uh, when you are in college, you do all your intramurals with your same group of friends. And uh, unfortunately, my group of friends, I mean, we weren't terribly unathletic, but we weren't like super duper, right? And uh, there was this one team that was really good that we played every year that we lost to and uh, often. And uh, this team, they were also just horrible human beings. You know what I mean? Um, they had a gal on their team. She always cheated. If you ever played soccer, she'd always grab your shirt, you know? And at uh, one time, not kidding, this girl actually ripped my shirt off my back. And I'm like, that's a PK. Like, if you were a man, I'd punch you in the face right now. I'm so mad. And she looks at me. She's like, I didn't grab your shirt. I said, my shirt's in your hand. Like, you grabbed my shirt. Like, you ripped it off my back, right? She was terrible. Well, anyway, um, we beat this team one particular game, indoor intramural co-ed soccer season. We beat them. And the ball was on the other end of the field. But I was just so excited, you know, and I was far away from the ball because up to that point, I was pretty lazy. But when we won, they blew the whistle, and I'm excited. So I give it one of these. Yeah! And then when I land, um, my foot twists out like this, my right foot. I twist it. And uh, it was so painful, I felt pain just shoot up straight up here all the way to my head, and I saw stars. I saw stars, right? And I'm like, my leg is broken, you know? And I'm rolling on the ground, biting my lip, like, thinking that my leg, I mean, it's probably just hanging by the skin. Like, I probably broke my foot off, you know? And, uh, I mean, it's bad. And it's funny, because everybody's on the other end of the field, and they turn around, and here's John just rolling on the ground, like, ah! They're like, what happened? And I'm like, somebody attacked me, called my own klutzy self, Okay? And, uh, I mean, it's bad, right? I'm biting my lip. And um, to my credit, it was a little swollen, you know? I mean, so I make my brother and, and his friend carry me across campus to the nurse's station because I can't walk. It's so bad. And I get there, and, and the nurse is like, yeah, it's, um, it's a minor sprain. You probably are going to need crutches for a couple, maybe a few weeks. And for the record, few means three, doesn't it? Three weeks, right? So I'm wearing the crutches around campus, and I mean, it's hard to look at all these able-bodied people, you know, all on their two legs, coming up in here, walking around. I got to make girls get me my lunch trays, you know, all the time, because I can't carry them, because I got my crutches. Um, and every time I put my foot down, it's like, ah, uh-huh, you know, and I have that pain again. You know, I have that pain, a flashback to the trauma of that ankle sprain, right? And so, I mean... I get done with my three weeks, and I put my foot down, and I'm like, my leg is not healed, right? So I, need, I, I kept using the crutches for four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks. I'm still using crutches. No lie, no exaggeration. Eight weeks. And my roommates by this time are like, John, come on, for the love. Like, your ankle's fine. I'm like, no, it's not. You don't know the pain that I'm going through, you know? I hope you guys have sons, handsome, articulate sons, you know, who are star athletes. And No, just kidding. I didn't say that. But they were, they were talking to me, and 
One of my pre-med roommates, who's pretty much a doctor, right? I mean, you know pre-med is the same as a doctor, comes to me too. He's like, John, there's like biologically, I mean, your leg is just healed. There's just, it's fine. Like, you're literally fine. It's just stiff. I was like, no, I'm not fine. I'm not fine, right? And finally, I come back from class one day, and they have like a crutch intervention. They're all like sitting there, and uh, true story, and uh, they're like, you got you to gotta give up the crutches now, John. Like, we're going to take your crutches from you. And so um, they make me walk to the dining hall uh, without my crutches, and I'm like, eh, eh. Oh, I'm like, oh, they, they were right. They're totally right. Like, we're good. We're good. Totally good here, right? And uh, it's funny because I had the strength to walk on my own physically, but mentally, I was not healed, right? Physically, I'd been healed, but mentally, just it wasn't there, right? Even though I was healed. I feel like there's a lot of us who struggle with this spiritually. God's done a great healing work in our lives. We've been healed spiritually, uh, but we have this spiritual inferiority complex, like we're still injured, you know? And we walk around on our spiritual crutches thinking, oh, man, it must be nice to be like them. We look at other people who can, you know, pray well and know the Bible and went to Bible college or our elders and deacons and grew up in church, and we're like, oh, man, they're so godly. I mean, I wish I could run spiritually like they could. I wish I could walk like they can walk, but I've got this scarlet letter. I've got this past. I've got this brokenness. I've got this problem. I mean, I could never share the gospel like Kristen Hill does. I could never be able to. I could never do it. And what I call this is sort of like a spiritual inferiority complex, right? That's what it is. And, and we hobble around spiritually acting like we're all injured, don't we? I mean, it's all in our head, but we act like, oh, I could never. <laughs> I mean, to be able to do that like they do. And the reality is we're relying on this crutch. We're asking this other people to carry us. Well, I need her to come share faith with my friend. I mean, I need him to break down the word because, I mean, I couldn't do it on my own, right? We rely on these people. We have these crutches. It's a big problem, isn't it? Because it's not that we're not healed. I mean, Jesus' work on the cross is sufficient, Right? And he died once and for all. His healing is complete. Our sins are gone. We're new. We can approach the throne of God with boldness. And yet we have this inferiority complex. I think it's one of the biggest barriers to us keeping our goals, right? I think so many of us, what we do is we underestimate what God wants to do through us. And we overestimate what is required to be used by God. And we exaggerate our spiritual weaknesses. That's what we do. We play this game. We're all spiritual hypochondriacs, right? And this week, I want us to put down the crutches. I want us to put down the crutches spiritually. I want us to walk into 2018 full and able-bodied with confidence and joy that God can work through us and in us. These last few weeks, we've been talking about making goals, but this is a conversation about sustaining those very goals that we made. We don't need to use other people as crutches anymore. God gave us what it takes to walk with boldness and confidence. And uh, I think there's just a lot of us in here who have what it takes, even though we don't believe it. And I just want to deal with our spiritual inferiority complexes. I'm not trying to undermine spiritual authority today. I want you to understand, I think spiritual authority is a good thing, right? I have spiritual authorities in my life, the leadership team of the church, the elders and deacons, right? Um, I think for many of you, I serve as a spiritual authority as your pastor. That's not bad. I'm not saying that's bad. There's a big difference between inferiority and authority, right? Authority is good. Inferiority, I think it's from the devil, And today, we're going to be focusing on dealing with feelings of inferiority. This is the feeling that says, well, I'm not good enough spiritually. I never could be. And I think so many of you, you made these goals last week. It was fun dreaming, writing, and praying. But now you're running into the nitty-gritty, and you're starting to think, I don't know if I have what it takes. I don't know if I could ever do this. Maybe I was just dumb thinking that God could use me greatly. Uh, Maybe I was just dumb thinking that God could move greatly on my behalf. I mean, maybe that's just silly. I've titled this talk, Put Down the Crutch. Put Down down the crutch. And that's my hope and prayer for our church. Maybe today could be the day where we put down the crutch. We're talking about Paul, and uh, last week we talked about how Paul is the greatest missionary and evangelist of all time. This week we're going to be just going verse by verse through 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul planted this church in the ancient city of Corinth, and uh, the church itself is doing awesome. Okay? It's thriving. It's banging on all cylinders. They've got these charismatic pastors named Paul and Apollos. Everybody loves both of them. Okay? They're great. The sermons are like powerful. Every week it's like, whoa, how do they come up with that? I mean, that's awesome. The music is like moving. The musicians are great. They're tight. They're on a click track. You know, the church is growing. It's hitting its numbers. I mean, everybody just loves this church. The problem is the people, the people doesn't seem like they're actually getting healing. They're still walking around on spiritual crutches. They're still hobbling around. They have not changed since they started following Jesus. They're still doing all the same things. It's like you claim to follow Jesus, but there's no change in your life. This is really upsetting to people 
who aren't sure about God yet. I'm sure there's a lot of you here this morning, you're like, well, I'm a believer in Jesus. I'm a believer in God, but I mean, really, is he the only way, right? And you look at other people who are all in with Jesus, right? Jesus is the only way. He's my leader and forgiver. And you're like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite that far in yet. And the reason why so many of us aren't is because we look at those people who are all the way in and we don't really see any difference in their life, right? And Paul looks at the church in Corinth and he's like, yeah, this is a problem. This is an issue. And I'll be honest, I'm talking to First Church about this today. I wrote an entirely different sermon. And uh, on Thursday, my wife and I realized that this wasn't the right message for the church. So I, I rewrote the message. And I wanted to bring this special word to us now because I don't want us to turn, turn into the church in Corinth. And I'm not saying that we are. But this message is a warning so that we don't become like that, right? Um, it says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, uh, Paul says, Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk to you as though you belonged to this world, as though you weren't even followers of God yet, or as though you were infants, infants in Christ, right? He goes, I had to feed you with milk, with baby food, with Gerber, with formula, not with solid food because you weren't ready for anything stronger, and you still aren't ready. It's like, wow, Paul. That's, uh, that's salty right there. That's, that's salt in the wound. He doesn't pull any punches. I want you to understand, Paul's not talking about deep sermons that make you think. The church was never designed to have deep sermons that make you think. I think that's what the church in America wants today. You know, Pastor, you just give me a, a deep sermon that'll blow my mind with the original Greek and Hebrew, you know? But leave that application muddy. <laughs> don't convict me spiritually, okay? I want to be confused at the end of the message because I don't want to have to take any action, right? That's not what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about a deep sermon, right? When he talks about real adult spiritual food, he's saying messages that call you to action for the Great Commission, Okay? Paul's like, I can't talk about the Great Commission because you guys have obedience issues. I mean, you're not turning from your sin. You're not transformed by the work of God, right? I can't feed you spiritual food for adults. Their mindset hasn't changed from before they followed Christ. And you know what? They could have lots of people come to church, but if they're not seeing people far from God filled with life in Christ and with newness and spiritual healing, then there's something wrong, isn't there? It says in verse 3, for you're still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another. You quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove that you're controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like the people of the world? And part of his beef here is he doesn't see any results of the presence of God in people's life. People who go to the church in Corinth should be changed, but the business people who run their businesses and also go to the church in Corinth, right, they hide taxes, right? They hide income. They say, oh, I'll take cash under the table. We'll do whatever, right? We'll pay vendors late and less, right? The parents who go to the first church in Corinth, right? They raise their kids um, like people who don't go to the church. They choose to be their friends rather than authority. They spare the rod. They spoil the child. They prioritize extracurricular activities in their kids' lives. And Paul's like, hey, I mean, I'm not saying that you need to be perfect, but if you follow Christ, it should change your life. Right? It's not that you can't mess up, but, but if you're following Jesus, there should be a transformation in your life. We have a core value at First Church. It says growing people change. We really believe that the presence and power of God in our life should result in some change in the way that we live. And Paul's saying, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. And what he's doing right now is he's identifying the symptoms, but he's about to point out what he believes is the crutch of the issue. Okay? Right now he's been identifying symptoms, but here is the core of the problem. Next verse right here he's going to show. This is, this is the core of the problem. He says, when one of you says, I'm a follower of Pastor Paul, and another says, I follow Pastor Apollos, aren't you acting just like the people of this world? After all, who is Apollos and who is Paul? We're only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. And this is huge. This might not make sense to you, but it will when I get to further, further verses. Paul's saying here, I'm afraid that the church is following pastors instead of following Jesus. And a church is just a gathering of people coming together to learn about Jesus. Pastors, they lead the church, but they're not Jesus. They don't bring new life. Jesus does that. And listen, listen. When you rely on pastors only to give you new life, without seeking God in the Bible and praying on your own, when the pastor's message is the only time during the week where you'll hear the word of God, you're going to never reach the potential that God has for you. That's a problem, right? Paul's pointing out the problem here. And this is the problem. I think so many people rely on the crutch of pastor as mediator between them and God, right? Hey, pastor, you read the Bible for me, right? You explain it to me. You feed it to me. And that's like, man, totally not the point of Christianity. The entire point of Christianity, what makes Christians special, is that we don't need a crutch to get us to God. We can approach the throne of God with boldness and without shame because of the work of Christ on the cross. We can go straight to the fast, past, or straight to God, straight to the Father. We don't need a priest. 
We don't need a pastor. We don't need a guru. We don't need an imam, right? We are all priests. We're a chosen nation. God made all of us able to access the Father. We're all sons and daughters of the King. And we can ask our loving Father because we have a relationship with God, because we can know God. You see, as Christians, we believe that this life is just a precursor um, to our eternity. And our standing with God depends on a relationship with Jesus. And because Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, because of his work on the cross, if we ask him to be our forgiver and leader, we can have a relationship with God and spend eternity with God in heaven. That's a big deal. I mean, that's a huge deal. Think about that. Think about what that means. Infinity in heaven, no matter what happens in this life, nothing can take the joy out of that. This is why we celebrate a church. This is why church is a celebration. I mean, I love coming to church to celebrate. Church shouldn't be a stodgy, dry, religious experience. It should be a life-changing truth that gives hope and meaning and purpose every day. And look, if you're here today, and church, at best, is a stodgy, dry, religious experience, if you're missing that purpose and that passion that comes from a relationship with God, fill out a next step card. We'd love to call you this week and help you figure out, man, what is missing for you? right? I mean, there's obviously something that's missing there because God does give us passion and purpose in our daily relationship with him, right? I want you to have that. Now, Paul is ticked because the church in Corinth is relying on their pastors like a crutch. Church in Corinth come up to Paul and they'd be like, hey, Paul, I need you to come here and share Jesus with my friend, right? It work. I need you to do it, you know? I mean, you know so much. And Paul's like, hey, look, 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 look. I could do that. I'd love to do that for you. I'd love to help you. But really what I'd love is for you to do that. Right? I can train you, and I can equip you, but the same Spirit of God that's in me is in you. Right? There's no like hierarchy of value within Christendom. Like You're all followers of Christ. Like You could do that too, right? The church in Corinth would be like, hey, um, Paul, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? And Paul's like, yeah, it'd be an honor. I'd love to pray for you. Question, are you praying for you? Are you praying for you, right? I mean, God doesn't love me, uh, you know, in some way that's greater than his love for you. God loves us all uniquely and completely. God has never loved anybody like he loved you. And he yearns and longs for you to seek him in prayer because he loves you, right? Church in Corinth be like, hey, pastor, you need to feed me. And Paul be like, what? Feed you? You're a grown man. You're a grown man. You don't need, you're a grown woman. You don't need me to feed you. I say that to my kids a lot. I'm a grown man, right? That's, things are not going good in my house. When I am a grown man. <laughs> we have access to God through Jesus. Check out what Paul says in a different book in Galatians. He says, there's no longer Jew or Gentile, pastor or parishioner, slave or free, male or female, right? This is really incredible that Jesus lifted up men and women together, the first person in human history to do that. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. You don't need a priest to get you to God. You don't need to continue to sacrifice to get to God. Jesus' work was complete once and for all, so you can put down the crutch because Jesus has healed you completely, and you are free from the burden of sin. But the church in Corinth, the church in Corinth is not enjoying that freedom. And they are specifically looking to their pastors to mediate their relationship with God. And Paul says, hey, put down the crutch. You've been healed by the power and work of Christ. God has restored you, and you can run spiritually. Check out, he continues his rant here. He says, each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it. But this is critical. It was God who made it grow. He says, hey, look, we've seen lots of life change at First Church Corinth, right? Here in Corinth, we've seen God do a lot of work in people's lives. But you know, it wasn't pastor's words that did it, right? It was the power of God's spirit in your life. Like, let's not give credit to something that doesn't have power, right? I think this is a big deal. Pastor's words don't set people free from anxiety and depression that they've struggled with for their whole life. A pastor's words don't allow people to forgive someone they've struggled with bitterness against for their whole life. It's only the power of God's spirit, the presence of, of, of Jesus in our lives that does that, right? And Paul says, hey, I don't want you to give credit where credit isn't due. He goes, it's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes a seed grow, Hey, someday I'm not going to be the pastor of this church anymore. I hope it's 40 years from now. Kristen and I are going to buy grave plots, right? I mean, whatever. We're good. We want to be here forever. But listen, listen, listen. I hope that you don't come one weekend and think, oh, Pastor John's not preaching. You know, oh, man, who's this pulpit supply that they brought? Man, I hope that we come expecting and preparing for the word of God to be preached. And I believe that God's spirit can work through anyone, right? It doesn't matter who's preaching. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose. And both will be rewarded for their work. I love that God rewards us for our work. But Paul swings really hard here and insightfully. And he points out a problem that I think still plagues the church today. I think what happens is we tend to associate our faith um, with pastors and conference speakers, right? And we look at these people and, like, they're basically the word of God to us. That's a problem, right? This is... 
Excuse me. This is totally messed up. I felt it coming for a long time. I was like, stay calm. You can push it back down, John. Okay? You can do it. No, you can't. No, you can't. It's coming. It's here. This is totally messed up. I think a lot of us, like, our relationship with God is summed up with listening to podcasts and YouTube videos. That's it. That's it. And I'm not saying that's bad. I'm a sermon junkie. I listen to dozens of of sermons every single week. I love it. I love it. I love preaching. I love communicating. I love studying it. I love learning about the craft. I think it's awesome. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. We see God in his word. See, 500 years ago, there was this guy named Martin Luther, and he was going to church, and he looked around, and he realized, man, nobody reads the Bible except for the pastor. In fact, the Bible, nobody can understand it except the pastor, and that's messed up, right? So we started this thing called the Reformation, and the whole Reformation, every single church that isn't Catholic was birthed out of that movement. He reformed the whole church, and, and the whole thing that was founded on is that everybody can read the Bible. Everybody can read the Word of God. And here's my concern today is a lot of times I look at this church, and I'm not saying it's our church, but I look at churches in general, and I feel like the only time people really hear the Word of God is from pastor. And I'm like, that's a problem. We should be seeking God's truth on our own, right? Like, the Word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. Like, are you seeking God and His truth at home, right? You can do that. God wants to speak to you in it and through it. I use the YouVersion Bible app. Right? That's what I use. And it's just the Bible. Uh, There's lots of Bible reading plans that I use. Sometimes I just read the Bible. I like the book of Romans. I like the book of Acts. A-C-T-S. My favorite book, Acts. Try it out. Read it. It's exciting. It's interesting. There's no special class of Christian. We're all part of God's family. We're all his sons and daughters. And we can all go fearlessly, without shame, to the very throne room of God because of the work of Christ in our life. I think there's this big hoopla in church whenever a leader or pastor fails morally. One of my favorite pastors recently failed morally and was removed from his church, Perry Noble, right? Great pastor. I still love his sermons. I love his ministry work. Um, But he fell morally. He got addicted to uh, alcohol, and uh, he left his wife. He's divorcing his wife. He was rightfully removed from his church. Now, when that happens, a lot of times people's faith gets shook. They're like, oh, I'm so shook, right? I mean, my pastor, how could this? And it's like, why is your faith in pastor? Your faith isn't in pastor. Last time I checked, pastor is not the son of God, right? I mean, if Jesus came from heaven to earth and failed morally, okay, now my faith is shook, right? Now my faith is shook. But pastor, pastor is not the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is, right? Jesus is who we put our faith in. Our faith is not in pastor. So put the crutch down. You're not wounded. You're healed because of the work of Christ. Paul skips down to verse 21. It says, so don't boast about following particular human leader. That's not what we put our faith in, right? Human leaders are good, but they're not God. Paul says, put your faith in Jesus. Now, I hope that we don't come to church just excited about a sermon, right? I mean, I love preaching. I work hard on the messages, really, really hard. I put a lot of passion and effort into all of them. You know, they're like babies to me. But, but listen, listen, I hope that your excitement in church isn't singularly the sermon, People a lot of times tell me, well, I'm, I'm going to leave my church because I'm just not getting fed spiritually. That's a terrible reason to leave a church. If you've been a Christian for more than a year, church is not about feeding you spiritually. Think about that. That's crazy, right? I mean, you don't need to be fed when you're grown. Leave a church because it's not living out the Great Commission. That makes sense. I'd leave a church in a heartbeat. If we're not reaching people far from God, seeing them be filled with life in Christ, which is the purpose, the commission, the mission that God has given to the church, yeah, leave it. Leave it right away. Get out of there, right? But, but not being fed? Being fed is for babies. People far from God come to church to hear the message of Jesus taught plainly and simply and clearly because they're being formed spiritually as infants. And yeah, they need to be fed. That totally makes sense to me. That should happen on a Sunday morning. But mature Christians learn to feed themselves. Imagine my mother feeding me. You know, my cute little Asian mother. She was here last service. Mom! Mom! Mom, more. That'd be ridiculous. Mom, I got, can you, yeah, no. That'd be ridiculous, right? I hope that you're feeding yourself all week because Christianity is not Sunday morning, right? Christianity is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I think there's a lot of us who are like, man, I mean, on church, I leave so encouraged. But then, you know, Monday, Tuesday, by Wednesday, I mean, I'm not even sure if I'm following Jesus anymore. Yeah, because you're not following Jesus anymore, you know? Like, we follow Jesus every day of the week. And uh, here's, a, here's a big thing that I want you to understand. There's a big dichotomy right here. We experience interest when we come to church expecting to be fed spiritual food, okay? If your purpose for coming to church is to get fed spiritually, you're going to be very interested in coming to church. 
I, you know, if you have a, a church that, that does good feeding, good messages, whatever, you'll come and you'll, you'll be interested. That's the best case scenario. I am so interested in my church. My church is so interesting. It's very interesting. I'm interested. Okay, it's interesting. But check this out. You experience passion when you come filled with God's spirit, expecting his presence. When you have been feeding yourself all week, when God's spirit is full in you, when you've been seeking him in his word regularly, you don't come to church with interest. You come to church with passion, filled, expecting God's presence. Man, this is so much better. This is so much better. This is first gear. This isn't bad. But when you've been following Jesus for a little while, you should, man, move beyond. You move beyond baby food. You should be ready to experience God's presence. If we're going to experience God's passion this year, it begins in our homes. Passion is our word for the year as a church. We want to experience it together. But this begins in our homes, right? It's a group effort. I want you to put down the crutch. I feel like so many Christians, this is what we look like, okay? Here's pastor, here's Christian. Carry me. <laughs> Get the baby carrier. It's like, this is ridiculous, right? We grown. We grown, right? You don't need me to feed you. You don't need me to carry you, right? God gave you legs. You can walk on your own. Okay, and uh, here's the difference. Here's first gear for the church. This is when you're a new Christian. Church is all about God working in you. But when you become a mature follower of Christ, when you've been following Jesus for more than a year, church is no longer about God working in you. You shift gears. You take a next step class. You move beyond that. And all of a sudden, church becomes God working through you. And I love that. I love being a part of a movement that's greater than myself. I love seeing God use my life to transform other people's lives. And this is every follower of Christ. God wants to use you to transform this community, right? Pa church is not pastor, like, doing all the work. Church is the people of God doing the work of God for the glory of God together, right? It's about God working through us. This is Christianity. And this is what God wants to do through you. He's got great plans and purpose for your life, so step into it. Now, we're going to wrap up this passage um, here that Paul is writing with these next verses, and I'm not going to lie, they're confusing, okay? They are a little confusing, but I'll explain it, okay? It says, for everything belongs to you, whether Paul, Apollos, or Peter, or the world, or life or death, or the present or the future, everything belongs to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. This is what, this is what Paul's saying right here. He's saying, you've been adopted into God's family, so you have this spiritual inheritance that's huge. Everything belongs to you. You're, you're, you're very wealthy spiritually now because you've been adopted into God's family. Let me explain it this way. I want you to imagine Queen Elizabeth, the Queen of England, comes to you. And uh, I, can, I can do Australian. I can't do British. But imagine she comes to you and she says, I'd like to adopt you into my family and make you a prince or a princess, right? You will receive access to all the I can't do it. I can, I can do Australian. I just can't do British. Can't do British. Okay? You'll receive access to the royal yachts and the jets and the military and the palaces and the vacation homes and the money and the power. I'm going to adopt you into my family. That's awesome. That'd be great. Can you imagine the queen of England? She says, I'm going to elevate you to the same level as my sons or my grandsons, William and Harry. Right? Like you're going to be, can you imagine receiving that? There's a royal ceremony, right? You go to the cathedral, and they play the music, and they give you this scepter and this robe, you know, the red robe with the fur top that's white with the dots, and you get the hat. And I mean, you look good, right? You are, you are appointed and anointed a prince or a princess of the empire of England. That would be amazing. That would be awesome. It would be sweet. Now, can you imagine? They have that big ceremony, right? And the very next day, um, you wake up, and uh, you go to, to, to Harry and William, and you're like, hey, you think you could get me into Buckingham Palace? And they're like, what do you mean? Do you think we could get, you are a prince or a princess now. You can just go right in. This is your house. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. Can you get me in though? They're like, what do you mean? You are, you're a family. You're Windsor. Like, we're here. Just go on in. This is your home. This is, are you too good for your home? Just go in, right? And they'd be like, you'd be like, I, I don't know. I mean, I think you're more a prince than, than I am. You're more royal than I can't get in, right? We had the ceremony. We, your, your, your family, like this is your house. Just go in. You can go in. You have refrigerator rights, like everything. This is you, right? This is, what exact, this is exactly what happens to Christians through Christ. Except our spiritual inheritance is far larger than the Empire of England could give to us, isn't it? What we do is God looks at us and he elevates us and he says, man, you are part of the family. I've made you my son. I've made you my daughter. You are royalty. You are royalty now. This is in your blood, okay? The blood of Christ literally covers you like a robe, right? The royalty of Christ of my firstborn son is transferred to you. And I think so many Christians are like, hey, pastor, um, do you think you could get me in up there? Like, could you like pray or, you know, talk to God or whatever and do your magic and like get me in the house? It's like, yeah, I mean, I, I can, but so can you. This is your home. Like, you live here now. 
Like God has transformed you. God has anointed and appointed you for a special purpose. He's called you to it from before you were born. He had a plan. He's rescued you and he's redeemed you. This is your house. This is your place. I I don't know. (laughs) Ah, It's funny. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Right? But you don't understand. Like I got this issue. Right? I can't. I can't walk. I can't just walk in there. I need you to carry me. I need you to carry me over the threshold, man. I mean, I can't get in there. He's like, carry you over. You're, he's healed you. What's wrong with, right? This is how we act, isn't it? We have this spiritual inferiority complex. I think so many of us, we feel inadequate. And I'm here to tell you today, Christ healed you. You can put down the crutch. You can walk, Ricky Bobby, right? God's made you new, and you have what it takes. You don't need pastor to feed you. God gave you a church to encourage you. Church is good. We're here to build you up. But you can stand on your own two legs spiritually because of the work of Christ. God is in you. His his spirit is at work in you. So go out and serve him. Study his word and seek him. This is why I love First Church. I see a church of kingdom builders here. I see a church of world changers here. Mature, strong, audacious followers of Christ. First Church is a place where people grow. And I see the next generation of world changers here. One of the big problems with churches across the country is that most of the people who are carrying the church on their backs are in their 70s. And we got a lot of that here. A lot of our very best volunteers and leaders are in their 70s. Um, but I see that changing, right? Generation X was totally absent, but you guys are back. The millennials, you're here. You're leading. Millennials, you need me to affirm you? You are doing such a good job. So good. Let me affirm, right? No, but you're here. I see the church led by next generation people. I see a new generation say, here I am, Lord. Use me, right? I'm proud, and we need that. We need that. God designed you and made you and called you and equipped you to do this from before you were born. And as we begin to think about considering the possibility of closing, I'm a pastor. I wrote in my notes as we close, but I know it's not even close to the end, right? Because I wrote that, and then I wrote a whole bunch more after it. So as we begin to think about considering final approach, but we're not even close, right? Um, I'm not trying to undermine the importance and the value of mentorship, and discipleship. I think it's really good. I have mentors and disciples and authorities in my life that I go to for prayer and advice. It's not a bad thing to ask a friend to pray for you. But when that replaces your own prayer, when that replaces your own carrying yourself, when you just give up saying, hey, I need everybody else to carry me spiritually, that's a problem. That's a problem, right? And um, I think one of the big issues is that we misunderstand what discipleship is. I want to kind of redefine what discipleship actually looks like here, okay? Discipleship is a trainer trainee relationship, not a teacher-student relationship, okay? Your trainer, he comes to you and he says, hey, here's how you lift. Now, you get on there and do, do, do 25 reps, okay? You do it, right? We're doing burnout today. I want you to get under there and I want you to do it. I want you to go until you can't do it anymore. You work hard in a trainer-trainee relationship. Teacher-student, they say, hey, here's the knowledge. Store it in your head, but you don't ever have to do anything with it, right? And this is, this is what I think so many people think Christianity is, is I need knowledge. I need this. No, 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 no. You are training. You are training so that you can, can serve God's kingdom and build it up, right? Discipleship doesn't happen when you sit on the bench watching others play, pretending to be injured. It happens when you get out on the field, right? And you practice and you play. I think one of the big issues is churches become a place where um, the congregation comes and watches pastor. Hey, pastor, you're doing a great job. You do it, you know? Great job building the kingdom. I saw you leading that person to Christ. That's great. No, 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 that's not what church is, Right? Pastors coach and encourage when the church takes the field and the church conquers the land. Pastors should not be the biggest evangelists in the church. The church goes out and takes the land. We had a next step class um, during our first service and uh, what brought great joy to my heart was seeing somebody who has just started following Jesus herself. She's been following Jesus for maybe a year. I got to watch her lead somebody to Christ in the next step class afterwards. I just thought, man, that's so cool, right? She's a brand new follower to Christ. Here she's leading someone else to Christ. Like, that's it. Man, you can walk, you can run. You don't need to have years of knowledge and information and whatever. No, no, it's a trainer-trainee relationship. That's discipleship right there. And I'm making it, I want to make it clear, I'm not saying the church isn't valuable. Church is valuable. God calls us to be a part of it. God literally says in Scripture, don't give up meeting together as some people have. He says, it's sinful to not be a part of the church. We come together. But if you've been following Jesus for more than a year, this place is not about you getting fed This place is about you celebrating God's presence with passion and letting God accomplish his purpose through you in this community, right? This is preparation to follow Christ for the rest of the week. So step into leadership. Step up to the plate. Stop sitting on the bench with your crutch saying, oh, I can't do it because I'm second class. You know, I mean, I got these issues. I can't. No, no, no. 
Jesus' work is sufficient. Jesus' spirit is at work. You can be healed. You are grown. You can do this. I'm here to tell the church, look, if you made a goal this year that's scary and audacious, you could do it. You can do it. God's hand is on you. I believe that you can do it. You don't need me to carry you. Seek God in his word. I hope that this is not the only time this week you'll hear God's word. You have access to the very same God I have access to. I want you to hear these statements. You have what it takes to be a leader for God's kingdom. You have what it takes to live a bold life for Christ. You have what it takes to accomplish a powerful God-given goal. You have what it takes to build God's kingdom audaciously. You have what it takes to read God's word and find his truth and heart in it. And you have what it takes to share your faith. Peter is perhaps my favorite of the apostles. He's just hilarious in his life. But he's also very bold. He's kind of a big mouth like someone else I know. And um, this is what he says in 1 Peter 2.9. He says, for you're a chosen people. You are royal priests. I want you to understand, he's talking about Christians here. And he's looking at all the Christians of the earth, and he says, you're the priests. Priests used to be people who would mediate between God and humanity, right? And now he says, every single Christian is a priest. Every single Christian can go to God. They don't need someone to mediate. You're not second class. You, just as you are, can approach God himself. God has a relationship with you. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. Think about this. Think about this. This is Peter, y'all. Peter who walked on water. Peter who saw the glory of God and Moses and Elijah himself. This is Peter who saw Christ ascend into heaven as the angels rejoice. And Peter says, this is not my job alone. Yeah, I'll do it. But you show the goodness of God to others. You're the one who's been called. For he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Into his wonderful light. This is God's call for your life. You have what it takes. You have what it takes. If Peter himself looks at you, people, he says, you're a chosen nation, a royal priesthood. You have what it takes. In Christ, you have access to God. So put down the crutch. Put it down. Now, to the last three blanks on your outline. These are going to go fast. But I actually wanted to make it practical. This is what putting down the crutch actually looks like. I want to teach you, like, this is what it means to me this year. Simple, applicable, clear. Number one, pursue God outside of church. I want our church to be people of the word. I don't want us to just be people of the pastor. I want us to be people who seek Jesus in his word. I'm asking you, download the YouVersion Bible app, start a Bible reading plan. Do it with a friend. You know, you can do it with friends now, whatever. Do, do a Bible reading plan or just read the Bible. Read the book of Acts. Like, it's such an exciting book. Read the book of Romans. Oh, I love the book of Romans, right? It's awesome. But look, can we pursue God outside of church? Can we start our mornings off with a just quiet time set aside for God? Say, God, I want, I want my house, my heart to be built on your truth, right? Can we do that? Number two, can we build God's kingdom together? Let's put down the crutch and build God's kingdom. It's not my job to build God's kingdom, okay? It's our job, all of us, together, step into leadership. Step, serve, right? Our save people, serve people is one of our core values. Would you serve? I'm tired of people coming here and just sitting on the sidelines. Man, it's been years. You've been coming for years, and you don't do anything, right? And it's not that we need you. It's that God wants you to experience it. God wants you to be a part of the solution, a part of the change. Your life is bigger than just you. He wants to do great things through you. Right? Rescue people, rescue people. You can reach out to your friends. Right? You don't need Kristen, the star closer, to come in and reach somebody for the gospel. You can go talk to somebody, right? God wants to use you for that. Lastly, I think this means giving. I've been kind of weak on teaching our church about this. I want to challenge you to be a part of giving. Right? I mean, our church has grown fivefold. Our budget has not grown fivefold at all. At all. I want people to say, you know what, I want the rest of my week to be redeemed. I love giving here because that means every part of my week, my work, the thing, the fruit of my labor becomes a part of transforming people's lives. And that's a blessing to me, right? It's not because this house needs it. It's because I love seeing God use it. It is an act of worship. Build God's kingdom. The third one is kind of a big one to me. I'm going to be teaching on this more in the future, um, but uh, this is kind of the first time I'm really talking about it. I want us to grow a faith that can stand on its own. And uh, this is really important to me. Um, We live in a polarized culture, okay? It's very polarized. I don't know if you guys have turned on the news or you've heard people. Everybody's very opinionated. And uh, there's two very polarized ends, and and basically the opinions of our society sort of look like two dumbbells, lots of people on each very far spectrum, not a lot of people in the middle, not a lot of understanding, not a lot of conversation. And um, I believe that a loving God 
lay down his life in the greatest sacrificial act of love, the greatest act of selflessness that the world has ever seen, where he made a way where there was no way so that we could experience eternity with God in heaven. That's the greatest act of love that the world's ever seen. I believe that Jesus is the only way to God in heaven. That belief, that belief right there, um, there's a lot of people who see that as an absolute intolerable act. And um, I believe that, that my faith, um, and specifically the exclusivity of my faith, um, is coming under attack. Uh, in the political spectrum. And so I just want to lead a church. I'm not saying it will happen. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I, I just, I want us to reach a place as a church where our faith can stand on its own. This was the last sermon that you ever heard. If this was the last time that you could freely read the word of God, you have enough of his word memorized and written in your heart so that your faith could stand on its own. Do we have enough leaders in this church where we could all become our own house churches and we could all hear the gospel of Jesus worshiping in our own houses together? I mean, are we doing that? Are we discipling at that level? I want to grow a faith that can stand on its own as a church. And uh, look, I understand this was not like hooting and hollering, rah, 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 rah. I want this to change our lives. Like, I want us to hear this message and think, you know what, God? Here I am, Lord. Use me. I'm putting down the crutch. I'm not a second-class citizen. I'm walking to what you have for me. And uh, I hope that you have taken something away from this. I have some clear applications, but I want you to write in your notes, here's what I'm going to do today. Read my Bible, whatever it is. Start giving, start serving, whatever it might be. But I want you to do something because of this message today. And uh, the band's going to come out, but I want to ask you to stand. And uh, we're going to close um, in a word of prayer. And uh, I just want to pray for our church right now, and I'd ask you to join me. Lord Jesus, I just lift up this church, this gathering of people together, and uh, we just thank you so much for creating this gathering, giving it to us by the power of your spirit after you ascended into heaven. I thank you that you designed your church to do even greater works than your son Jesus did. I thank you that we've seen that unfold, and I just ask that you would use our church greatly in this community. Um, specifically, I ask that you would use each individual person in this room by the power of your spirit to be a part of a revival in Jasper County. Lord, I pray that we could see 5,000 people a weekend in five years worshiping you together for your glory, Lord, because every, number na every, every name is a number. Every number is a name, and every name is a story, and every story matters to God. I thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Use us. We're here. We're your servants. It's in your name we pray. Amen.